All right, thank you, thank you. Welcome, welcome. This is Dr. Basaiti. She's an endocrinologist and associate professor in the Department of Endocrine Neoplasia and Hormonal Disorders at the University of Texas and the Anderson Cancer Center in Houston, Texas. Dr. Basaiti is the director of the Thyroid Nodule Clinic, specializes in thyroid cancer, and has authored numerous peer-reviewed research articles and book chapters. Dr. Basaiti is a recipient of the Psyca a thyroid cancer research grant and has spoken at many Psyca conferences. She is a medical advisor for Psyca and a 2011 research grant recipient. Thank you, Dr. Vasidi. Welcome. Hi, everyone. Just going to share my screen. Okay. Um, so thank you for that nice introduction, Barb. Um, I'm so excited to be back at Psyca. Um, I do wish that um, I do hope that we can all see each other soon, but I'm glad that we found a way to reach more people and, um, and, uh, and be together and still have this meeting safely. So today I'm going to talk about uh, biomarker testing, what biomarkers are, and who actually needs testing. So thank you so much, everyone. Okay, so when we talk about thyroid cancer, as all of you know, um, there's four types of thyroid cancer. Uh, papillary is the most common, follicular second most common. Together though, throughout the talk, I'm gonna call papillary and follicular differentiated thyroid cancer, or you'll see it abbreviated as DTC, okay? Um, and then the rare, uh, rarely um, people can have medullary thyroid cancer, which is from a different cell of the thyroid, and then anaplastic thyroid cancer, thankfully, is the most rare. So I'm gonna try and touch base uh, um, about biomarkers in those uh, three groups in general, okay? So when we talk about differentiated thyroid cancer, remember that the, the three prongs of treatment are surgery, radioactive iodine, and then sometimes more surgery and more iodine, and thyroid hormone suppression are giving you a little more um, thyroid hormone than your body needs. And for medullary thyroid cancer, it's typically surgery and sometimes more surgery, but no radioactive iodine here. And then thyroid hormone just to keep your thyroid levels normal. For anaplastic thyroid cancer, because it's often growing faster and spread at the time of diagnosis, we typically will start with systemic therapy and we may or may not do surgery, right? So a different uh, 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 paradigm. So when I talk about biomarkers and when we use it, I'm going to show you, in, it's gonna be different stages for all these cancers. So when we talk, the most common of these is DTC or differentiated thyroid cancer. And um, if you took all comers, about a third of the time, differentiated thyroid cancer will recur. About 10% of the time, it'll be metastatic. And about 5% of the time, will it be refractory to radioactive iodine? Okay, and those are terms that I'm going to be um, repeating, which is why I'm showing you this. So when we talk about thyroid cancer that's refractory to radioactive iodine, we're talking about a very rare disease, okay? And a small... Um, um, a segment of the of these cancers. And so the reason that's important is even when you see your doctors, you know, you can't blame somebody if they haven't seen a lot of thyroid cancer, if they've never seen um, a patient with radioactive iodine refractory, because again, most of the thyroid cancer that they'd see would have been taken care of with surgery with or without iodine. So the treatment options for patients who have metastatic disease in the case of DTC is TSH suppression or giving you a little more thyroid hormone than your body needs. If it's iodine sensitive, giving radioactive iodine. And then the rest of these options we're gonna talk about are common to all three um, to all three major types of thyroid cancer, okay? So sometimes you can remove a, a metastasis, you can do a radiofrequency ablation or cryoablation, meaning freezing or heating it, you can radiate them, um, and you can do embolization. So those are available for all of the cancers. And then there's what people call traditional chemotherapy, um, which is also called cytotoxic chemotherapy, which basically breaks down rapidly dividing cells. And then there are other therapies, which most of you have heard of, which is in different sessions, but we'll talk about why that's important to understand those therapies because biomarkers play a big role there. And so I want everybody to remember that radioactive iodine is the first molecular uh, targeted therapy because it, it targets dis specifically the thyroid cell. Um, and it, so it is very specific to differentiated thyroid cancer. And then I don't want people to forget about radioactive iodine because in patients with stage three or four disease, Radioactive people who were treated with radioactive iodine and, and their tumors took up iodine, it does improve, it is associated with improved overall survival, right? So I don't want people poo-pooing radioactive iodine and be, you know, 
um, oh, why are we even doing it? Well, in high risk disease, it does have, it is associated with improved survival. Okay. Well, what about the little extra thyroid hormone? So in differentiated thyroid cancer or DTC, which is papillary and follicular, keeping, uh, giving you a little more thyroid hormone than your body needs or keeping your TSH a little bit lower than normal is a form of cancer treatment. So when patients say, oh, they're not giving me chemo, they're not treating my disease. Just by giving you thyroid hormone, we are treating your disease, right? We're treating the cancer. And so based on the stage of the cancer and whether there's residual or leftover cancer there or not, the TSH goes lower. Um, the more disease you have, but not undetectable, okay? And this is just a um, graph to show you that patients who have higher risk disease, stage three, four disease, that lowering, keeping your TSH suppressed does, is associated with improved survival. So giving you the thyroid hormone is helping your survival, right? Um, and now there's different studies going on as to how long that needs to be done, but in the initial stages, it is a form of anti-cancer treatment. Well, what about other things to treat cancer that's spread outside, which is what metastases mean? So if it's in the CNS, central nervous system means brain or spine, you can do surgery, you can do radiation, and you can do iodine. If it's in the bone, again, if it's weight-bearing bone, they can do surgery, you can do radiation, and they now have more localized radiation, so it's not two weeks, it can be a, a zap over one or two days radioactive iodine if they're sensitive. And then there's what's called bone modifying agents. So bisphosphonates like zolindronic acid, um, denosumab, another, the brand name is Exgeva. So there are drugs that can help decrease it from spreading in bone. So what do we do when patients have thyroid cancer outside of the neck? It's what's called distant metastases. We have to look at where the disease is and there's five factors that we look at. And the reason for this is once thyroid cancer has spread outside of the neck, there is no cure, okay? So they may take up iodine, you can use iodine, you may be able to do surgery, but typically it's, it's, um, it's incurable, right? And the reason I say that is not to try to be negative. I'm saying that so people understand that because I can't tell you how many patients I'll see and they were like, oh, they told me that it's fine and that thyroid cancer is the best kind to have. First of all, cancer is never good to have. Oops, sorry. Um, and second of all, that um, it's important to understand what we're dealing with so psychologically we're able to deal with it, right? I can deal with the fact that I'm living with cancer, but I need to change my mindset to say I'm trying to cure myself of cancer, right? It, it, it helps a lot. Sorry about my slides. Okay. So when patients have thyroid cancer outside of the neck, we look at where is it? Is it in a critical location that if it grows, it'll cause problem? Does it take up iodine? And if it's resistant to iodine, it's called radioactive iodine refractory. Does the patient have any symptoms from their disease? Um, and sometimes that's hard to tell. What's the size of the tumor? And is it growing or not? That's what we mean by structural progression. These will help determine what the next steps are. And then when we know, when we think about if patients have thyroid cancer that's refractory to radioactive iodine, there are four definitions that we look at with decreasing evidence. Do they have known sites of metastasis that don't take up iodine? Did their disease progress within six to 12 months after treating with radioactive iodine? Have they had a lifetime dose of 600 millicuries or more? And does their um, tumor take up FDG or radioactive sugar on a PET scan? Those tend to be um, tend to suggest that the disease is a refractory or resistant to radioactive iodine. What are the guidelines? ATA's American Thyroid Association. I'm just showing you one of the guidelines here um, that if patients have known thyroid cancer that's outside of the neck or in the neck, but can't be surgically removed, that isn't causing symptoms, is not clinically significant, then it's okay to monitor these patients, give them a little more thyroid hormone than the body needs or what's called TSH suppression, and then just follow you, okay? Don't say goodbye, follow you with scans of where the disease is every three to 12 months, right? And that's so important because what you're looking for is, okay, you have disease there. We need to figure out if it's slow growing or fast growing or not growing at all. So we have to keep seeing you for life with imaging every three to 12 months on TSH suppression. Okay, very important that everybody understands that. Now, if somebody has disease that is growing, so you now have done those serial imaging and you see that the disease is growing in the lungs or the neck, then the guidelines say that that's the time to think about systemic therapy. And we're gonna talk about the systemic therapy, serafinib, linvatinib, okay, kinase inhibitors, and then targeted therapies, okay, and what that means, because that is where the biomarkers come in. The reason I'm explaining this background is to understand why we even need to test for biomarkers 
um, is because we need to understand what are the treatment options and when are we using this information. So um, the targeted therapies for thyroid cancer now, thankfully, there's a slew of them, right? Specifically for differentiated thyroid cancer that's growing over a one-year period, there's serafinib and lenvatinib, okay? These are what are people calling MKIs, multi-kinase inhibitors, TKIs, tyrosine kinase inhibitors, or just KIs. And then for medullary thyroid cancer that is growing and not surgically resectable, there's vandetinib and cabozantinib, okay? Again, MKIs, TKIs. For anaplastic thyroid cancer that has a BRAF V600E mutation, dibrafenib and trametinib in combination was approved as first line, okay? I added on there now as of last month for differentiated thyroid cancer that's failed other therapies, dibrafenib is also FDA approved. So congratulations and thank you for all of you who participated in the trials um, because now we actually have treatment options for patients for all of these, right? The importance of, of participating in clinical trials or research trials, which you have other sessions on. If a thyroid cancer has NTRK, altered thyroid cancer, there's two drugs, larotrectinib and entrectinib FDA approved now. And if pa patients have um, microsatellite instability or what's called MSI high tumors, um, immunotherapy, pembrolizumab is FDA approved. And I do want to point out that everybody called in and was freaked out because the news talked about those patients, six patients with rectal cancer who were cured of their disease because they got immunotherapy and everybody called wanting immunotherapy. Those patients had something similar to MSI high tumors, okay? We already have that option in thyroid cancer with pembrolizumab, but we don't find tumors that have that MSI high, unfortunately, in thyroid cancer, but we have the option for treatment, so there's nothing different about those rectal cancer patients, right? Okay, RET-altered thyroid cancer. So if your thyroid cancer has a RET fusion or mutation, there's two drugs that are FDA approved. So look at that. Compare this chart to even three years ago. Our options are so many more, so many more, so much more, sorry. So what are targeted therapies? So remember, chemotherapy just means treatment against cancer, right? So everything is a chemotherapy. But when we say chemotherapy, what triggers in people's mind is, oh, I'm gonna get something in my vein, it's gonna make me nausea, vomit, and lose my hair. That is traditional chemotherapy or cytotoxic chemotherapy. That's, they basically, the drug interferes with rapidly dividing cells, okay, of all types. So it gets your normal and your abnormal. Targeted therapies, which are these drugs that I just showed you the list that are FDA approved, the goal is to do less harm to normal cells and more effective against cancer cells, okay, to, to hit the, the actual target of the cancer. They will hit normal cells, that's why you get side effects, but the goal is less harm to normal cells. So again, radioactive iodine is considered a targeted therapy. Um, now, when we look at any one cell, it's like an alphabet soup. Our cells are very complicated machinery where we have multiple signals where the cell talks within itself and to other cells to grow, to die, and everything is a beautiful, perfect cycle of life. When you have a cancer cell, then one or more of these pathways goes haywire. You have what's called a mutation or a change in one of these parts, a semi-part of a cell or pathway. So if you get a change in one of those cells, then basically the, the signal that tells the cancer, okay, die now, okay, grow now, okay, die now, and keeps it in balance is off. And it just says, grow, 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 grow. Okay, so that's what would people mean when they say mutations or alterations in one of these pathways. And it looks like an alphabet soup, um, you know, and so you'll see here names, things that come up in thyroid cancer. VEGF means it, it has a high blood supply. Thyroid cancers tend to be bloody. And then you'll see RAF and RAS. These are things you commonly see in thyroid cancer. So to break it down even further, this is the inside of a cell. The most common mutation in papillary thyroid cancer is BRAF or BRAF, okay? 40 to 70% of papillary thyroid cancers have a BRAF. And some for follicular thyroid cancer have BRAF, but not a V600E. And then you have RAS, and then you also have RET fusions and NTREC alterations. When they're more advanced, you have things in the PI3 kinase pathway. So all this means is that there is some change in the pathway within the cell that's made the machinery abnormal and it doesn't know when it should just die off because the cell has aged like normal cells, so it keeps growing, that's cancer. So what are biomarkers in thyroid cancer? Well, biomarkers are a way to measure those mutations or alterations, those changes in the cell pathway, okay? They're not, most of these are not genetic 
in that I can pass it down to my children. We call it all genetic testing sometimes, but it gets confusing. There's hereditary genetic, which is in every cell or half the cells in my body. And there's somatic mutations with our changes or biomarkers that we can measure in the cancer cell. Okay, so what I'm showing you here is in the cancer cell with one exception, I'll tell you. So in differentiated thyroid cancer and aplastic thyroid cancer, the most common is BRAF, but you can have RAS, you can have RET fusions, you can have NTREC alterations. And then in medullary, 20% of the time you have a germline mutation, which is hereditary genetic mutation, which is in the 50, in, in the cells of your blood that's passed down. But and the, the other 80%, 50% um, of that 80% can have a mutation on the RET gene on the tumor only. Okay, so you can have medullary, have a RET that's not hereditary. Okay, the other half has RAS and some others. So, um, and the reason this is important is understanding the cellular pathways that become abnormal um, in cancer can then we can think about drugs that can attack those cellular pathways to kill the cell off. Okay, so biomarkers are important. So we know what makes the cell go abnormal, then what drugs are we going to use? to treat it, okay? So biomarker testing, how do we even do this, right? Are there markers that can be done to predict who's going to respond to drugs? Well, yes, thankfully research has been has advanced in thyroid cancer. So the ways to measure biomarkers in general in cancers is you can do a tissue biopsy for somatic mutations. What does that mean? Well, I can biopsy your thyroid or your leftover thyroid cancer um, that's in your neck or what's been taken out. If you had surgery, I can test the tissue that's outside of your body for those changes in the cellular pathway or what's called somatic mutation that makes your thyroid cancer grow. You can also do what's called a liquid biopsy, which means you draw the patient's blood and look if there's some tumor that's shed in the blood, okay? And measure that BRAF or that mutation or change in the patient's blood. Okay, now it's confusing because liquid biopsies can also find hereditary changes, but we know by the percent of cells affected, whether it's a hereditary thing, meaning I can pass it down, or it's just found in my blood because my, I have cancer and it's shedding. Okay, so circulating tumor DNA means my tumor's shedding. It's not hereditary. And tissue biopsy is the most common, either when it's outside of your body or from a biopsy inside your body. Okay, and we look for those changes in the cell and we measure them, right? And as an example, you can look at the blood in anaplastic thyroid cancer and you can find what the cancer has on it about 84% of the time. Now in, in medullary and papillary, it's not very, it's like a third to half the time where you can find something in the blood and that's with people with fairly advanced disease. So it depends on how much cancer is being shed, whether you can measure it in the blood or not. So let me give you an example of a patient. It always helps to tie it back to patients. So I have a 55 year old gentleman who had uh, uh, his thyroid removed, radioactive iodine and was put on thyroid hormone a little more than his body needs. And then he shows up one day, he has um, uh, thyroid cancer that spread to his lungs that's resistant to radioactive iodine. So he was treated with the drug that was FDA approved at the time, serafinib, but he had side effects. Then he was treated with linvatinib, which was also approved at the time for a year before his cancer grew. He developed shortness of breath, he developed liquid around his lungs called pleural effusion, and he needed oxygen, right? So he was definitely symptomatic from his disease. So they put these catheters, um, these, these tubes to drain the fluid around his lungs. And the question is, what next? I've used the two FDA approved drugs. Where do I go from here? And so his CT scan, the white spots are his um, cancer, um, looked like that. Well, anytime we're about to start a patient on targeted therapies or kinase inhibitors, or if we're changing treatments, we always do an MRI of the brain, even if they don't have symptoms, to look for um, thyroid cancer that's in the brain. So people call this brain cancer. This is not a separate cancer. This is thyroid cancer that's gone to the brain, so called brain metastases. So this gentleman had very small spots, but they were still present at the time of changing therapy. So now that his that cancer has grown on linvatinib and serafinib, what should we do? Well, this is a good time to do mutational testing or biomarker testing, right? What, is there any cell, cellular pathways that are abnormal? Does this cancer express any abnormal genes or proteins that are making the cancer grow that I can find a drug to attack it? So we tested his tumor that we already had, right? That was already removed years ago. And he had a BRAF V600E, which is the most common 
um, mutation or change in the cellular pathway for papillary thyroid cancer. So there are drugs, thankfully, that were FDA approved for melanoma at the time that have a BRAF. So we just said, let's go ahead and try. And we treated the patient with dibrafenib, a BRAF inhibitor. Okay. And we know in patients who had melanoma with a BRAF that if they had the, the, the cancer in their brain, that it shrunk on these drugs called BRAF inhibitors or dibrafenib. So we went ahead and treated him and to see. And when the patient started on dibrafenib in only a few months, he was doing well. He was off oxygen. Um, his MRI of his brain no longer showed the cancer in his brain. And his PET scan showed improvement in his lungs and his bones, right? Now, this is not a cure. It's important that your doctors explain to you that these drugs are not cures. And once you start these drugs, you take it as long as you can um, withstand it and as long as it's working on your cancer, right? Otherwise, we give it to you the minute we saw a spot. We give these drugs only when it's growing because it slows the growth down. So now how do you know which drug to choose, right? I showed you a whole page of drugs now that are FDA approved. And so this is not in the guidelines. This is an MD Anderson approach. And what I wanna show you is the time to do the biomarker or what's called mutational testing is in somebody you think in the near future may require what's called systemic or targeted therapies. This is somebody you think surgery will be difficult in the future or, um, um, or they're going to need some sort of chemo, or if they have distant metastases, right? So you notice I didn't say as soon as somebody's diagnosed with thyroid cancer, do biomarker testing. I know people do that, but if it doesn't change your management, why are you doing that? Because I'll tell you what happens with patients. They have a one centimeter thyroid nodule, gets biopsied and mutational testing sent at the same time. They told they have a BRAF and papillary thyroid cancer. Now for a one centimeter papillary thyroid cancer, you would just cut out half that thyroid, Right depending on the location, maybe the whole thyroid max, but you wouldn't give them iodine and you wouldn't do anything else. So why did you do that BRAF testing? Now the patient's gone and said, oh my God, BRAF, half these people do poorly and this happens and this happens, but not at one centimeter. So those, uh, those things that in a thyroid cancer that tell you how, what the chance and the risk of recurrence, you know, still, and you've had this in other lectures, that still trumps all mutational testing. So mutational testing should be reserved for when you're, any testing, if you're going to do something about it in the near future. So anyway, what this was before the BRAF inhibitors were approved, which was just two weeks ago, okay, for all cancers. We would do, we did the testing for BRAF if they, if they couldn't have, you know, lenvanibus rafnib because it was invading their blood vessels or whatever, we would go straight to a BRAF inhibitor. Otherwise we could consider lenvanibus rafnib. If they had one of those rare mutations like NTREC or RET, which I'll show you, then at the time we were putting them on clinical trial, now these drugs are FDA approved. And if they didn't have a BRAF, we would go straight to the lenvatinib and serafinib, okay? So um, it's important to know that we did a lot of trials looking at BRAF inhibitors because BRAF was the most common biomarker in papillary thyroid cancer. It's important to know if the drugs work or not. Well, they weren't cures like melanoma, as you've heard in other lectures, but it got FDA approved last month for any cancer that has a BRAF V600E mutation that has failed previous therapies. So some people interpret that the patient has to be on lenvatinib or serafinib because those are previous therapies. I interpret that if you don't, you can't have surgery and, um, and you failed radioactive iodine, those are previous therapies. So I will fight to the insurance to go ahead and get the BRAF inhibitor if they need it, right? So if, if somebody has tumors that are growing and they need targeted therapy, the biomarker testing will help decide what treatment I go on. So there's also current new approvals, NTREC inhibitors or drugs and RET inhibitors, right? And I'm going to show you some of that data. The reason that's important is about 1% to 3% of the time thyroid cancers can have an NTRK or a RET. So it's not just about BRAF. We need to look at the tumor and test for all these things because now, thankfully, there are drugs available. So NTREC um, was something recently discovered. They have what's called gene fusions or alterations that are present in differentiated thyroid cancer and in anaplastic thyroid cancer, not in medullary. And so they did um, trials looking at all cancers with an NTREC alteration and found if you see a bar, each bar going down on what's called a waterfall plot here is a patient. What they found was patients with any type of tumor in general that was tested here that had an NTRK alteration had shrinkage. So the FDA then approved um, the, the NTREC inhibitors for any cancer that has this, right? So you want to look for that needle in the haystack. Do I have an NTRK? So you want to make sure 
that your test can test for that biomarker. Patients, a lot of them had a long response to therapy. And so two drugs, larotrectinib and entrectinib, were FDA approved for any entrec altered cancers where other therapies are ineffective or the tumor has progressed. So in thyroid cancer, we tend to say when it's growing and we want to slow it down because, again, these are not cures. Um, and, um, and, and use these drugs. But that means that whatever tumor type you have, these drugs are approved for them. It's called tumor agnostic indication. So now you basically need to make sure that your tumor is tested for NTRK fusions one, and th one through three is what um, we've seen in thyroid cancer. Now, if you have a BRAF, you typically don't have an NTRK, right? We're learning more after you've received some drugs what um, you have, but typically you have those in the beginning. Then what about route alterations? Well, it's important that you understand or you know, that whoever's testing understands that RET mutations are common in medullary thyroid cancer. RET fusions are rare in differentiated thyroid cancer and anaplastic thyroid cancer, but they do exist, so it's worth looking for. Both of these, RET mutations and RET fusions, can be attacked by drugs called RET inhibitors. So RET mutations in medullary, whether it's germline, meaning hereditary, or it's somatic, meaning it's just on the tumor, can be attacked by these drugs. So there were two drugs also that are FDA approved for RET inhibitors. You've probably heard this in your other talks, so I'll go quickly through it. One was originally called Blue 667. It's now called Pralcetinib. And they took patients, each bar is a patient again here. The light blue are patients with medullary thyroid cancer. The dark blue are patients with um, either anaplastic or differentiated thyroid cancer. And you can see that the vast majority of patients had shrinkage in their tumors when exposed to a RET inhibitor. And they responded for a long time and fairly um, um, with fairly low side effects. The second RET inhibitor that had come out is LOXO-292. And again, I'm not going over these drugs because I know you have lots of other lectures on this. I just want to show you why biomarker testing is important and why thinking about this to put patients on clinical trials is important. So again, here they had patients with RET mutations with medullary thyroid cancer, RET fusions with differentiated and anaplastic thyroid cancers. And what they found was almost everybody had shrinkage in their tumors who had one of these um, RET changes. And long duration of responses and tumor markers went down um, within the first two weeks. So with that, RET inhibitors are FDA approved in thyroid cancers for differentiated anaplastic with RET fusions and what we call alterations and medullary thyroid cancer with RET mutations. The names are selpercatinib and pralcetinib, and they're both FDA approved for thyroid cancer that cannot be cured with surgery and is growing. There are some other biomarkers in differentiated thyroid cancer that may be of important but need to be tested, like ALK, ROS, TORC1 and 2, PI3 kinase, RAS, and um, microsatellite instability for um, immunotherapy. Okay. But what I've shown you is what's FDA approved. So, hence, biomarker testing should be done. Briefly, I want to go over um, before I um, open it up for questions. So, we will have plenty of time for questions is what about patients who have thyroid cancer that's refractory to radioactive iodine? And then you hear about, let me give them a drug to sensitize their tumors to radioactive iodine again, and then treat them with iodine, okay? That's called redifferentiation or resensitization. Those are words being thrown around. This again is not in the guidelines. It's not FDA approved, but these are things that can be done using FDA approved drugs. So this all started back in 2013. Well, it started for many years, but the most successful drugs that have come out are patients. Um, they were tried in a trial at Memorial Sloan Kettering using a drug called salumetinib, which is only approved in pediatric um, neurotumors, not in thyroid cancer. And they found patients who had thyroid cancer that's refractory radioactive iodine, you expose them to this drug for four weeks, then you treat with iodine and they can get shrinkage in their tumor. But what's fascinating to me is that many of these patients who responded had a BRAF or a RAS mutation, suggesting that those are the patients who are re resistant to radioactive iodine. We may need to think about resensitizing their tumors to iodine. So they went from no iodine uptake to yes iodine uptake and enough to go ahead and treat you. And you can see here. So then um, other people started looking at if patients have a BRAF mutation and I give them a BRAF inhibitor, can I resensitize them to radioactive iodine? And they found, yes, we can. And when we treat them with radioactive iodine, we can get some shrinkage. The problem is the second time, this next time you give the radioactive iodine with this drug, they're not cures. Potentially at the first time you get iodine, you may not need it any ever again. 
once you've become resistant and we resensitize you, it doesn't cure you, but it, it can get you off these uh, kinase inhibitors for a long time. I've had patients who were on the kinase inhibitor treated them with iodine when they were resensitized, and then they were off for another year, year and a half, which is a nice holiday. Um, and so we did the same thing at Anderson. We've been doing it off label, meaning not they're not FDA approved for this indication, but we went ahead and um, tried it. And we took patients who um, had thyroid cancer and were on targeted therapy for whatever reason. Um, they had growing disease, symptomatic disease, and then we did a scan to look if they took up iodine. So I'll show you an example. Here's a patient who doesn't take up iodine. So this is stomach uptake, bladder, and um, salivary gland, nasopharyngeal. So this is a negative whole body scan, but we knew from the CT scans they had disease. So after giving them a drug, one of these kinase inhibitors, they took up iodine. Look at this, the lungs lit up, right? A lot. And so you could treat them with iodine and stop the kinase inhibitor. It didn't cure them, but it held them off from further therapy. It also lit up a bone spot in the leg. Here's another patient here that doesn't take up iodine. Again, all these black spots are what's called physiologic or normal uptake, not cancer. And then we treated them with a kinase inhibitor and look at the lungs lighting up again, right? So it's kind of exciting. It unfortunately is not a cure, so we have to find better drugs for this. But again, if we understand the biomarkers in these patients' tumors, we can then pick the right drug to see if they sensitize to radioactive iodine, okay? Another reason to do biomarkers. This is a patient who had medullary thyroid cancer who had multiple drugs on clinical trials and still, you know, after a year would progress or two months would progress depending on the drug. And then we tested his tumor in what's called the liquid biopsy. We talked about earlier, you measure if tumor is shedding and if there is a gene or a protein that's abnormal on the tumor that's shedding in the blood because we didn't have any tissue to biopsy at the time. And it found resistant mechanisms, which means why is this patient not responding to these drugs? We're giving him all these drugs. And he came, and what came up was he had, a, he already, we had a known RET before. Once we exposed him to all these drugs, his cancer became smart and changed the mutation and made a new um, abnormal gene on the cancer. So these cancers become smart and they get a new gene that then um, can make the cancer grow and escape that targeted therapy from working. So it's important to repeat this testing when, if this patient is responding to drugs and suddenly not, something's different about that tumor. Did that cancer get smart so you can re-biopsy or do a liquid biopsy at the time, right? So there's a role for biomarker testing in advanced disease when you're thinking about starting chemo uh, systemic therapy and then if systemic therapy stops working, okay? So this, this was one of the first times that it was identified that this type of RET, it's a specific subtype of RET, is actually um, makes the tumor resistant to the common uh, kinase inhibitors, right? So fascinating. You're like, okay, well, these drugs were working. Now it's not working. And he got a RET and these should work. But this type of mutation is called a gatekeeper, which means it's resistant to these other kinase inhibitors. So we need to think about something else. Um, so... In summary, who should get biomarker testing? It should be patients in whom you think testing will make a difference. So that's patients who you think are going to need systemic therapy in the coming year, targeted therapy, chemotherapy, whatever word you want to use, right? Because there are now drugs that can be personalized to your type of cancer. So for differentiated thyroid cancer and medullary thyroid cancer, um, and patients with advanced disease, those whose surgery cannot remove all the disease and patients with metastatic disease, not all comers with small tumors, but in anaplastic thyroid cancer, biomarker testing should be done on everyone because by definition, anaplastic thyroid cancer is stage four, right? So by definition, the rule is metastases. By definition, the rule is progressive disease. So at biopsy, at diagnosis, anaplastic thyroid cancer patients should have biomarker testing, period, end. With differentiated thyroid and medullary, you can um, uh, do it in patients who have advanced disease. Okay. Remember, the vast majority of people who have differentiated thyroid cancer don't recur after surgery plus or minus iodine. A third of them recur and 10% of them have metastatic disease and 5% of them have radioactive iodine refractory. So you don't need to do biomarker testing in all these patients. Now I know you're gonna tell me some of you that it's become cheaper, it's become easier to do, but the, anxi the, the anxiety it causes to patients is massive. And literally that is harming my patients today. 
So I do want to point out that there's a large variation in cancer. We have so much more to do. So if this x-axis is the normal lifespan and you reach your goal line, and the y-axis here is the volume of disease, anaplastic thyroid cancer patients in general don't reach their goal line, okay, and have a high volume of disease. Patients with radioactive iodine responsive differentiated thyroid cancer tend to reach their goal line, not always, but tend to reach their goal line and have small volume disease. But those patients who have radioactive iodine refractory disease it's a very mixed picture. Some of them will reach their goal line and have small, slowly progressive or stable disease till they um, pass from something else. Some of them will have rapidly increasing disease at some point in their disease and have high volume disease. And we need to understand the difference between these patients and these patients. So one start is biomarkers, but even within that, there's something else. So remember, this is an alphabet soup and this is changing every day. More and more research is being done, um, thankfully, and um, more and drugs are being available to patients with thyroid cancer. So we will, with your help, find the cure. If somebody's interested in looking for clinical trials, there's a slew of um, uh, websites, but clinicaltrials.gov is probably the most up to date. Um, and you can, of course, talk to your physician. And I liked what the president of the American Society of Clinical Oncology had said many years ago, about 10, 12 years ago now, that you know, we have to think about cancer, um, not as stupid, you know, that they're smart cancers and cancers don't come with one mutation or alteration. They can get lots of mutations and we need to discover it and discover drugs. And one single drug may not work, right? Um, that they, they don't think of cancers that not having resistance, they get smart, they outsmart it, and then they will beat the single drug to bring resistance. So we have to personalize patient's um, treatment. Find the right patient, what's the abnormal gene or pathway, the right drug, what is the drug for that pathway, and the right dose at the right time, right? The goal of treatment is to prolong patients' lives without affecting their quality of life as much as possible, right? Not just, oh, I have cancer, give me a drug. We have to think about the whole patient as a whole. So how are we gonna do this better? Well, we have to identify novel drugs, do more research, and thank you to you all for participating in clinical research and being interested in asking questions and challenging your doctors um, and your healthcare team. And then we need to biopsy the tumor and send it for molecular testing. There's many companies, many ways to do it. There isn't a right or wrong way to do this. And then we need to also think about testing the blood for molecular testing, um, even though it doesn't work very well for differentiated th thyroid cancer, about a third of the time, it works very well for anaplastic. So finding the right type of tumor and the right type of test. And remember, we have a lot of FDA approved drugs now based on mutational testing, NTRAC, immunotherapy, if you have microsatellite and stable high, RET inhibitors, BRAF inhibitors, and then we have the more generic kinase inhibitors. And then there's off-label use of drugs that are in off-label or in clinical trials. And we think about enhancing the patient's tumors with radioactive iodine. I'm sorry, with drugs for radioactive iodine. So remember, there's a slew of drugs out there. So testing is important if we're thinking about it. So with that, in the remaining time, I want to open for questions and thank, um, I'm here talking, but it takes a whole team to take care of patients. Um, it's not just me. And at the center of that team are our patients. And thank you for all that you do. So thank you so much. I'm going to stop sharing my slide and then read some of these questions um, that are in the Q&A. Um, okay, so uh, one pay, uh, somebody's asking, my genomic testing came back as TET2. What exactly does that mean? And so I would refer you to, um, to, to talk to your doctor who can get the help of a genetic test. Things are changing all the time. So right now there are some patients with thyroid cancer that have TET2, and we don't know fully what it means in terms of targetable drugs, but things are changing every day. So I encourage you to talk to your doctor so that they look for clinical trials and think about whether this is what's called a driver mutation or a, 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 a biomarker that's making the cancer um, uh, change. Um, Entrec fusion. How do you make a decision on whether to pick larotrectum or entrectinib, knowing that entrectinib is inhibited more than Entrec? Okay, so this is a good question. So, in patients who have thyroid cancer that has an Entrec fusion, how do you know which drug to make? And most, to be honest, um, looking at how the trials went, there was a small percentage of patients with thyroid cancer on those trials. So, we don't have the answer to your question, or whether it's true that you truly get better inhibition or not, right? So, if you're talking, there's one thing when people talk about inhibition in cells, in animals, and in the phase one trials where there was a small number of thyroid cancer patients. And so, just because you can inhibit something more in a cell or they thought they got better responses, 
it's, it's, you know, you want to look at all the patients as a whole and be careful of numbers. So people are making massive conclusions. And there's also new NTREC inhibitors coming out. So the, honestly, the honest answer to that is the decision is typically made by what that physician is comfortable with. And we don't honestly know the answer to is one better than the other. Have you seen any germline mutations with patients who also have NTREC tumor fusions? And if they have an NTREC and one tumor could potentially be different mutation fusion in other metastatic sites? Okay, let me rephrase this question. In general, patients who have mutations, somatic mutations, which means that mutation is on the tumor, there are certain um, tumor types where we know this is um, not hereditary and it's what called um, um, somatic, so it's on the tumor. And we know that they are driver mutations, which means it was there from the beginning and it makes the cancer grow. Sometimes we'll find these other changes in the tumor, but it's not, we don't know if it's making the cancer grow. It might be a pathogenic variant, a variant of unknown significance, which means we don't know what it means and what it does. Um, and so, yes, people can have dual mutations, meaning I can have a BRAF and I can also have um, a PI3 kinase or a P53, which are other mutations. But the BRF was probably there from the beginning. And as it got more advanced, a P53 or a TERT was added. So there's a list of mutations that are typically thought of as mutually exclusive, meaning typically people don't have an NTREC and a BRAF, right? Or a BRAF and a RET, okay? But we're learning a lot more. And what we found is we, we always have said BRAF and RAS, as an example, are mutually exclusive. And now what we're finding is patients who have BRAFs, we put them on a BRAF inhibitor, we, and then they grow through it after they've responded. We biopsy, and now they have an additional mutation, which is RAS. And we said those two pathways were mutually exclusive. So to answer Susan's question, we are learning all the time, okay? And there are certain driver mutations that are there from the beginning, in even in early disease, but as we expose them to drugs, we may be getting new mutations that we thought were mutually exclusive. Okay, so in general, yes, NTREC is separate from BRAF and RAS. If genomic testing indicated only TERT and MEN1 germline negative for MEN1, are any kinase inhibitors or MKIs indicated? So if pa very commonly patients who are resistant to radioactive iodine can have what's called a TERT mutation, which we can measure, but it's not targetable. And so we don't have, right now, we're doing research, but we don't have an answer for what drug would work better in TERT, but people are looking at questions like, if I have a BRAF and a TERT, do I give just a BRAF inhibitor, dabrafenib, or do I give a BRAF with a MEK inhibitor, dabrafenib and, and trametinib? And there's going to be some posters about that at ATA, the American Thyroid Association. And so to, an to answer your question right now, we don't know, but right now there isn't a specific kinase inhibitor that responds better to people who have um, TERT mutations. I have BRAF and KMT2C. What does the KMT2C mean? Again, I uh, defer you to very often when your clinician gets these results, we go to um, this expert group in mutations and they look through their bank of all cancers, right? So just because we don't know what KMT2C does, means in thyroid cancer, we would probably look through the bank and see if it meant something in kidney cancer and did something work in a clinical trial, especially somebody in advanced disease. So we don't always know. Now our testing has gotten so good and so sensitive, we can pick up things that we don't know what to do with in thyroid cancer specifically. And we all need to be honest with our patients when we see them and tell them, listen, I don't know what this means. I'll go to so-and-so and ask. And if we know something in other cancers, um, then we'll do that. If you have very good response on targeted therapy, such as larotrectinib with almost 100% resolve of tumors, would stopping the drug make sense? Okay, so this is a good question for any of these drugs. If you are on one of these targeted therapies and you had really good shrinkage of your tumor, and be careful when people tell you 100% re resolution, because that to, to you would imply, oh, I don't have cancer, right? It almost never means no cancer. These targeted therapies um, put the tumor to sleep if you will. So you can have beautiful shrinkage and absolutely celebrate and be happy, but no, they like put breaks on the tumors. And if you stop the drug, it can grow. It doesn't always grow. And so this is what I tell my patients because they freak out when they're like, oh my God, this is a lifetime drug. So what we do is we start the drug. If they're shrinking, typically you see shrinkage the first three to six months and then things stabilize out, or you just see stabilization of disease from the beginning. And if it's stabilized out and you're seeing them, you know, you're at the point where you're seeing them every three months and scans are stable, then I have after a year and a half to two years given patients 
a break, or I mean, if they, if they need it from a side effect standpoint, they get a break. That's different. We're talking about somebody's tolerating the drug, tumors have responded and shrunk or are stable. Then what I say is, okay, let's, if, you know, with consent of the patient, let's hold drug, but instead of coming back at three months, come at two months and let's do these scans. If you're growing, you restart or growing enough, we restart, right? And if you're stable, we can do another two to three months. And if you're stable, keep going until it grows again. So I've had some, and we can't, we're not good at predicting who that is. So we wait the year and a half or two years to see what's happening. And if you go long enough, then I'm sorry. And then if you go um, uh, long enough off the drug, well, great, your, pay, your tumors were asleep, okay? At some point, I imagine almost everybody needs to restart. Right. The other thing that sort of answers this question is if you took an NTREC inhibitor, NTREC inhibitors are also being looked at for resensitizing radioactive iodine. There's a couple of publications now. So BRAF inhibitors and NTREC inhibitors um, and MEK inhibitors. And you give the drug for four to eight weeks. You do a diagnostic whole body scan. Look if they take up tumor. I'm sorry, iodine. You treat with iodine. You stop the targeted therapy after um, 72 hours. And then you do a short-term follow-up two to three months and see if the iodine held it back. So that would also be a drug holiday as well. Okay, so it's not just resolution of the tumors or shrinking of the tumors. It's also if they were treated with iodine. What about radiosensitive mutations such as ATM when it comes to reuptake trials? Are they screening for radiosensitivity before beam radiation and reuptake trials? Okay, so let me reword that a little bit. So um, Patient, so there are a lot of research coming out as to the different mutations or biomarkers that are not targetable by drugs, but they may start to suggest that tumors will be able to be sensitized to radioactive iodine or in general don't. Remember, these are very early suggestions. These are basic science trials, and we need to prove this in clinical trials to be able to say that. So I don't tell any one patient that, oh, you know, this you know, predicts this response and therefore this will work. What I'm saying is in these smaller trials, we've seen that this can predict response. So I would like to try this, but I'm warning the patient that this may or may not work so that we have a plan um, in, if it doesn't. So nobody can fully answer your question, Elizabeth. Um, it the trials currently are not saying um, if you have an ATM, don't resensitize, or if you do, do. Um, but there are trials that are more and more personalized and doing what's called stratification or sub-study. So they'll, they'll say, I predict, based on the basic science, that these patients will respond more. I'm going to treat them all because I don't know, but then I'm going to do a sub-study to look at that. And same thing with, you know, even thinking about radiation, right? Are these tumors less likely to respond to radiation? Those are not proven things, but they're hints and suggestions. And so we want our doctors thinking about that, but not telling a patient that we know for sure it's not going to. Um, I have, do I be, how are we good? Oh, we're good on time. Okay. I have a known BRAF V600 mutation, which was identified in neck nodal recurrence tissue. Original path was 70% tall cell PTC. I understand this wasn't necessary to evaluate at that time. However, in the event that there is distance spread sometime, would you recommend retesting new disease for mutations in case it has changed or mutated again? Okay, so this is a good question. So somebody who has a BRAF mutation at the beginning on the original thyroid cancer or in a mutate or recurrence or in a lymph node, you tend not to lose that BRAF in general, okay? So the vast majority of time, if cancer recurs or spreads, there are certain mutations called driver mutations that remain, okay? Now, I hesitate to say all the time. Occasionally, we'll have a patient who has a BRAF and any part that you test had the BRAF, but then there was this part that sort of exploded and just grew rapidly, different from the rest of the disease and will biopsy and it doesn't have the BRAF. That is extremely rare to lose the driver, the driver mutation. So in general, if you had it in the beginning, you tend to have it. Now, that's not true with P53, TERT, and some other more advanced um, mutations. So in other words, it does help to retest, especially in people who were responding to a drug and then, um, um, and then the tumor grew through it. Biopsying that new disease is very helpful. Okay, not getting genetic testing scared me. My surgeon had to insist repeatedly for pathology to do the testing, even though I have metastatic disease. Is it that expensive? Okay. So remember, we don't want to do biomarker testing on everybody because if we're not going to act on a test, why are we getting it? Now, I have patients tell me all the time, I just like information. I just like information. Well, I can tell you 
information that's not helpful can be harmful, right? So yes, it is expensive, but it's getting cheaper. Our testing is more sensitive, but I'm telling you, we have people come in with five millimeter PTC found incidentally on a nodule, I'm sorry, on, on a goiter that was removed. And they had that testing done and they know they have a BRAF and that anxiety literally led them to meet anti-anxiety meds, see psychiatrists, and that itself can shorten your life. The BRAF didn't shorten your life, right? So be very careful in what testing. It's the same thing with hereditary genetic testing. Why don't we just do hereditary testing on everybody, right? We do it on people who are at risk for disease because there are such things as false positives. And then what do you do with that information? So it's not just about expense, about money-wise, it's expense to your health and your healthcare team. And I have seen physicians overtreat patients because of the genetic testing, which is the wrong thing to do. You gotta know the basics and how did this patient's tumor present? Knowing this is, a, it's a, a, for example, a young person, a small tumor, no lymph nodes, the risk of recurrence is on the floor. So knowing that BRAF, now I'm gonna say, oh, in the future I can give a BRAF inhibitor. Well, the likelihood of something happening in the future is so low, but the likelihood of harming that patient is high, right? Or surgeons will go and do central neck dissections and remove extra things because they have a BRAF. Well, you know, that's never been proven. As you know, when you saw that in, I think there's some sessions on it and in the American Thyroid Association guidelines, doing further extent, doing more treatment does not necessarily mean better, right? Patients tell me all the time, throw everything you have at me. Wow, well now you can't swallow, you have a dry mouth, your quality of life has gone downhill and you probably would have lived to 100 without that thyroid cancer bothering you. Now, I'm not saying the thyroid cancer was nothing. I'm saying we harmed you by over-treating you, okay? So first do no harm. Um, please explain what TERT mutation means. So TERT is a, pa is a pathway in the cell that's abnormal. Um, it's not a targetable mutation, but um, uh, it, it actually um, can, can be found. There's a specific TERT mutation called C124T. So it's a change in an amino acid that makes the cell grow. If you have genomic findings, MEN1 and FLCN and TERT, which is rare, what can be done to help with the treatment if there are no trials available? Um, so some many times in thyroid cancer, the mutations are not targetable. So 50, almost 40% of medullary thyroid cancers have um, an, a, 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 a RAS mutation. Well, RAS is not really targetable, right? So sometimes things are not um, targetable, but we find them because our testing has um, become better and better and more sensitive. But it doesn't mean we won't find something in the future. So that information is still important. Already had 850 lifetimes so far of radioactive iodine on drug therapy. Would having more radioactive iodine be ideal to see if it would work? What is the lifetime amount we just don't give RAI? Okay, so I think what this person is asking is in a patient who's had 850 millicuries of radioactive iodine, right? So they, by definition, met the definition of radioactive iodine resistant, okay? Then um, they were put and they had progressive disease right? Because they're not going on drug just because they have disease. They had progressive or symptomatic disease. So they were put on a drug. Would it make sense to do a diagnostic whole body scan to look if their drug resensitize their tumor to iodine? Is it even possible to give more radioactive iodine? And at what point do you stop? So I think for somebody like this, who's had 850 millicuries, we, you know, over 500 millicuries, we talk all the time, is it worth it or not? And I think it's an individual discussion with the patient, just like everything else. There is no rule, right? Because first of all, radioactive iodine sensitivity and resensitation is not even in the guidelines to go ahead and do. So let's first put that disclaimer up, okay? So nobody here is saying we know radioactive iodine resensitization is the right thing to do. It is things that are available and people have started doing, but we need, we, we just talked about this in several of our societies is that we need to study this in larger numbers and put all our heads together internationally. So we're gonna you know, do a trial on that because we have to understand the safety, right? People think, oh, it makes sense if you can resensitize radioactive iodine, give me radioactive iodine, I can get off these chemos and therefore it's less toxic. Maybe, but maybe we changed your tumor to a worse tumor, right? We always have to think about everything as two-sided. So in somebody who's had 850 millicuries, it's an individual discussion with your doctor, pros and cons of giving more than 850. Check your blood counts. Did you have any bone metastases? Did you have any, uh, 
effect on your bone marrow? What is the likelihood that you will get into trouble? Um, there are fancy things that can be done called dosimetry to see what's the likelihood that you'll get poisoning in your blood or your bone marrow and or that it'll get into the tumor. So it's not a yes, no. This is a very individual discussion with the patient and we take these all very seriously. Um, so is a P10 mutation targetable in herthal cell cancer that has metastasized to the lungs? So herthal cell is very um, hard because the vast majority of herthal cell cancers don't have a targetable mutation, okay? There are, are people working very hard um, at figuring out what are, uh, we need better drugs, better trials for patients with herthal cell cancer because the tumor doesn't have targetable mutations in general. Um, and, you know, there have been studies with metformin and some other things of drugs similar to resensitizing. They're all in trials. And so, you know, um, it, herthal cell is a special group by itself. Now, <laughs> you can have a P10 mutation. It doesn't necessarily, so P10 is in that category of the PI3 kinase pathway that was green on that cell pathway that I showed you. And there are some tumors that have, there are, there are cancers that have P10 as a germline, meaning a hereditary. And then in Herthal, it's probably just on the tumor. And there are specific um, uh, mutations that don't respond at all. And there's some alterations that it's suppressed. It's a tumor suppressor, meaning it by shutting it down, it, it doesn't let um, the, the, the tumor stop growing. And so one could try drugs that inhibit in that PI3 kinase on trial or Everolimus drugs. But, um, and that was looked at in a clinical trial that was led by Dr. Jochen Lorch, um, whether patients who have thyroid cancer that have an alteration in that PI3 kinase pathway, including this P10, will they respond better to drugs called like Everolimus? They found interestingly that in herthal cell, 30% of the time, the tumors, herthal cell tumors had good shrinkage with Everolimus. Um, again, that was one study, um, but they couldn't find a correlation with if you had a P10 or something in that PI3 kinase pathway, unfortunately. Um, okay, another, the last question I see here is an NTREC question. Does NTREC plus TERT mean cancer could potentially mutate to something else such as anaplastic or another fusion? So any, any mutation um, can suggest that at some point, rarely, rarely, rarely will cancers mutate to anaplastic or become more rapidly growing. Nobody understands why the thyroid cancer will change and become more rapidly growing, but NTREC with TERT does not necessarily mean that it's more likely to transform, but in general, those that have TERT are more advanced disease. So I think that is all the questions, Ms. Barb, unless somebody has questions. We've done all the ones in the Q&A in the remaining one minute. Um, if there's any other questions, we're happy to entertain them. Otherwise, this was great. You've been a great audience, lots of nice questions. And um, um, let me know if you have any questions. Um, don't hesitate to contact us and um, have a good afternoon. A good thank you. Yeah, thank you so much. This was wonderful. We totally appreciate all your work, your research, and your taking your time to come and talk to us today. So thank you everyone for coming. And uh, we will see you all at the next session. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. Bye. Thanks, guys. Bye. Bye.